Okay, great. We are going to get started. It's right at one o'clock now. Um, I would like to welcome everyone to Drisha's fall programming and the first part of a seven part session course on the origins of Jewish academic studies by Dr. Hanan Gafni. Dr. Hanan Gafni studied at Mir Yeshiva in Jerusalem while earning his academic degrees from Hebrew University of Jerusalem and Harvard University. He currently teaches at Hebrew University and Ben Gurion University. We encourage you to ask questions either by unmuting yourself or putting questions in the chat in Zoom or the comments on Facebook. We really value your active participation, so please ask questions and send comments. And now, without further ado, Dr. Gaffney. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm very, very pleased and happy that uh, I have the opportunity. I heard for so many years about uh, Drisha. As a matter of fact, my wife was a student at Drisha, I think, probably 20 years ago or so, 25 years ago. So finally, I get to be a part of this uh, beautiful uh, institution. And also, I think it's uh, obviously we have a lot of negative aspects of this uh, coronavirus, but this is one positive thing that we can <laughs> we use the Zoom system and we can uh, actually integrate students from here and from, uh, and from Israel at the same time. And uh, I'm very happy to be part of this. Okay, so I want, I would like to share my screen with you here. And uh, one second, is that clear? Can you see it? Looks good. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna introduce briefly our class and try to get a, give us a sense uh, what we're going to do in this uh, mini series, but p again, feel free to ask anything that comes up, or if you if something is unclear, so I'll, I'll be happy to try uh, try to help. the The theme of this mini series, as you see on the screen, is the, about the origin of modern Jewish studies, and uh, what I was trying to do is uh, divided into two parts, not uh, equally equal in their size. The first part of this uh, series will be more about the theory of modern Jewish studies. In this part of the series, we will talk a little bit about the timing. When did the modern Jewish studies emerge? Where did that happen? What were the causes? Who was involved in this uh, whole enterprise? And in the second part of the of this series, again, the greater part, the larger part of the series, we'll actually talk about the contents themselves, not so much about uh, the historical information, but more about what did the Jews uh, how did Jews study, and what did they study, in the beginning of uh, in the beginning of what we call modern Jewish studies? So one part is about the theory, and the other part is more uh, uh, using reading texts and talking about the, the uh, outcome of this of these studies more in detail. Okay, so we're going to start now with the first part, the theoretical part, and I'll say a few words, a few opening words, and then I'll ask you a question. Okay, so uh, we're starting a little bit with the title and the definition of uh, uh, modern Jewish studies. So when people refer to modern Jewish studies, I'm going to explain what I'm saying. It appears on the screen just to help you also follow in simultaneously. When people refer to modern Jewish studies, usually refer to a phenomenon that starts in the 19th century it mainly uh, emerges, or the center of this is in, uh, in uh, Germany, but also in other Jewish communities or concentrations, mainly in German speaking lands. That's, uh, I would say, the main concentration of uh, modern Jewish studies. Scholars give a few names or titles to this phenomenon. Does anybody know how we call modern Jewish studies? What's the official word, what the word that scholars use when they don't want to refer to the modern Jewish studies, but they want to use their official name or the, yeah, the official name that people use or definition for modern Jewish studies? Does anybody remember? No? How do people refer to this phenomena? Okay, so uh, there are a few names that scholars use for that purpose. Sometimes people refer to this as using the German title, Wissenschaft des Judentums. I see that there are some comments here. Oh, no, that's uh, it. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, Oh, good. So some people prefer to use the German title Wissenschaft des Judentums. Wissenschaft means knowledge or science of Judaism. So that's the German way of saying it. In Hebrew, people refer to it as, uh, they use the name 
Chochmat Yisrael, it will appear in the screen in a second, Chochmat Yisrael. I'm using Hebrew words, Hebrew letters every now and then. If somebody, if something's unclear again, let me know. And in English, people refer to it often as the science of Judaism. So different titles for the same phenomena. Some scholars uh, try to dis distinguish between Wissenschaft des Judentum Chochmat Israel or the science of Judaism. It's not our goal to talk about that. That's really not a big theme. The main question I want to address with you is the following question, and that is, why do we designate a special title, Wissenschaft des Judentum, this fancy name, for the study of Judaism in the 19th century? Or, if I want to uh, specify, uh, did intellectual scholars throughout history in various fields uh, of Judaism were invested in studying what's so special about modern Jewish studies in this period in the 19th century in German uh, speaking lands or in Germany? Why do we designate a special name for this phenomena? Any ideas, any suggestions? Feel free to talk. Um, because uh, they started looking at it from a literary point of view, because they look, started looking at it in terms of possible alternate services besides God handing it, the Torah down from Mount Sinai. Okay, so you're referring to a few important aspects that I will address in a second, but before I try to use what you're saying, I, I want to ask anybody else, any other ideas? Why do we give a special title? Why do we refer to this as a special phenomenon, modern Jewish studies or the Wissenschaft des Judentums, 19th century Jewish studies? What's so special about it? People were study, ju studying Jewish material, Jewish uh, Judaism for centuries before. Rambam, Maimonides, Rav Saad Yagaon, so many scholars. What's so special about this? Anybody else? Well, I, if it's taught in a university, then it's open to non-Jewish students. It's okay, so you're, absolute, you're absolutely right. We'll talk about that maybe next session. But um, um, let's focus now about the ways that Jews are studying Judaism. Why do we refer, refer to modern Jewish studies, even within the Jewish community, as something so unique and special? You're absolutely right that it will also become open to non-Jews. Although I should also point out that non-Jews were also studying Judaism in previous generations. So again, why designate a special title for this phenomenon? Well, it doesn't rely on the typical Jewish sources. You know, the commentators, Chazal, etc. you know, up through, I guess, now. But um, it relies on uh, ad things adjacent that happen in the world, wor real world that maybe can be close to proven. Okay, so you're referring to another aspect but the way Jews are studying, they're, they're approaching Jewish studies in the modern time. So I will, I want to refer to uh, and rely on things that you were at least uh, alluding to, I think, in your words. And I think that there are two special important uh, features or characteristics of modern Jewish uh, studies in the 19th century that actually give us a reason why we should refer to this as something unique. And uh, the first thing I would say is we're talking for the first time perhaps for the first time, about uh, an attempt to study Judaism in a more, uh, I would say, in a more uh, scholarly, st critical, scientific, academic way, rather than from a traditional perspective. I would think that this is one main important contribution that the 19th uh, century scholars bring forth. And the second thing is, we're talking about a very specific historical and also ideological component that uh, goes along with modern Jewish studies in the 19th century. So on the one hand, again, we're talking about a critical approach rather than a traditional approach. And at the same time, it's very much ideologically uh, oriented, again, uh, shaped by the historical conditions in which these scholars are uh, operating. And again, uh, ideologically motivated in different directions. So what I wanna do today is uh, address these two aspects and also talk about their uh, mutual connections, traditional versus critical, and also the ideological component of modern Jewish studies. That will be our today's session. As I said before, next session two, we will talk about the theoretical aspects of modern Jewish studies. And from then on, 
we will actually try to demonstrate it rather than just talking about it theoretically. So I'm going to start with the first uh, feature here. I, before we proceed, I want to show you one more thing. Uh, this is a paragraph by uh, Ismar Elbogen, who was one of those Wissenschaftes Judentum scholars. He was very famous for his studies on liturgy, on and in uh, 1923, it was 1923, he writes an article, a passage on Wissenschaft and this Judentums or on Chochmat Israel. It was published in Hebrew, though Elbogen was writing it from Berlin in Germany. And he's asking precisely the question that we're dealing with now. What is so special that we call this, uh, our modern Jewish studies in the last hundred years as Chochmat Israel? And what we're going to try to do now is in essence, uh, try to explain and get closer to some answer to this uh, question. So we're starting with the first element, which is the critical versus traditional way of looking at texts. And the question I want to ask you now, take a piece of paper, if you feel, or at least uh, think about it for 10 seconds, 20 seconds. And, uh, and please feel free to talk. So it's more, we're a small group here, we're not hundreds of students, and it enables us to have a little bit of a learning experience and not just uh, me lecturing. So really feel free and contribute whatever you want to say. And the first thing I want to ask you is what, are the, what do you think are, how would you uh, try to define the differences between traditional way that we, and the uh, critical ways that we approach Judaism or Jewish texts? What, is the, what are the differences between traditional learning and critical scholarship? I hope you understand which hat belongs to which, uh, <laughs> which party. Yes, take 20 seconds. You don't have to answer me now. Take 20 seconds, think about it, write something formulate something and then we'll try to collect your answers and talk about it together. I, I don't want to put anybody on the spot. If you don't want to talk, you can feel free to be quiet and just listen. But if you want to say, I think whenever, whatever you say is more valuable than what I just try to feed you up with my own ideas. Okay, 20 seconds have passed. So tell me, how, do you, how would you define the differences between traditional versus critical ways of viewing Jewish texts? What's the difference between a yeshiva or a midrasha mm -hmm. and the university. God is the source. Um, yes, so who's, who's starting? I, I said that one of the differences is that in the traditional, God is the source of everything. And I think that's possibly not true and critical. Okay, so you're talking about the origin, the way people perceive the origin of the text. Do we view everything as divine or perhaps it's more human? Very right. important. What else? Um, look, it is kind of a, a, a result of that, but that um, certain things are not questionable, certain texts are not questionable um, in the traditional perspective, whereas the critical perspective would be more willing to question things. Um, or there might be certain people whose statements can't be questioned by the traditional method. Okay, so people, you're, you're saying that traditional people tend to trust what the texts say and not raise questions, whereas uh, critical people are willing to be more uh, open, open mind and raise questions. Okay, what else? Other ideas? I would, can I disagree with that? Yeah, of course. You can. Not, I would say that the questions themselves are different. Not that one questions and one doesn't, but that the questions are different. So no, I didn't mean that. I didn't mean that it, you couldn't question. I meant that you couldn't question certain, like the validity of certain people, or like if some there could be something if somebody, like for example, um, if like. And Amora might take the the attitude that uh, uh, something that that Atana says is not can't be challenged. And similarly, I think in traditional learning, um, there are certain people who can't be challenged if they make an assertion. I didn't mean you can't make you can't ask any questions at all. I meant that there are some things which are not you can't um, challenge. Okay, Elizabeth, you want to answer? <laughs> Amen. Well, that was the way you rephrased it. I think we're saying pretty much the same thing. I just think it's important to note that both, that, that in fact, questioning is very important to the study methods of both. Um, I think you move from the yeshiva, sort of chavruta style study into the academy. And I think that both also result sometimes in, in writings, but they're different kinds of publications for different purposes. That's my list. Okay. Anybody else? Other ideas, traditional versus critical ways of viewing Jewish texts or approaching Jewish texts. Yeah, just building on what was uh, said before, I might add that a traditional 
approach would be to take um, two verses or stories in the Bible and uh, compare them to each other. And the traditional side might look at the two stories of creation and try to resolve it in a way that someone who is on the critical side would not. Okay, they would so both ask questions. They would ask the same question. Didn't this yeah. just happen here? You know, but it happens all here. But the resolution would be different. Okay. So I hear what you're saying, and I'm going to use every word that you said in the next few uh, slides. So you will see that what you're saying is found there. Maybe not in the same order or formulation that you presented it, but a lot of your ideas will appear in the next few slides. So the first thing I would say I was referring to, I had to plant this before you came into class, so I couldn't wait for you to say what you say and then just make the slides so they were pre-made. Uh, but the first thing I would say it involves the motivation. I was hoping that one of you at least will address that too. The traditional motivation for learning is very different than the critical motivation. Traditional people, why do they study? Why bother study Judaism? Let's not be cynical now for a second. <laughs> What's the, what are the official reasons why we're supposed to study? Not for, for to get a better shidduch or to get a position as a rabbi, but uh, why do we study Jewish texts from a traditional perspective? To get close to God. Right. We're doing it as a religious, uh, uh, we're fulfilling mitzvah Talmud Torah. We're trying to uh, derive halacha, formulation of theological and ethical values, become close to God. By the way, if I make spelling mistakes, uh, forgive me. And uh, after class, you feel free to correct everything <laughs> if I made uh, any mistakes here. Okay, so... That's certainly one difference. Traditional people do, uh, do it to, for, as a religious commitment or as part of their religious uh, life. What about critical people? And again, try to think about the most, uh, the other extreme, not uh, people who are also studying in a, from a religious, uh, in religious context, but the people who are, who are studying in a secular university and they're studying, they're doing Jewish studies. What's gonna be their motivation? What's, what's their, what leads them when they study Jewish texts or any texts? Yeah. So what do you say? Critical scholarship. For what purpose? Why do people go to the university? Intellectual curiosity. Okay, so I would say again, as, you, as you're saying, if, for trying not to be cynical and because they're trying to get a diploma, so I would say it's again, they're striving for the truth, they're coming from intellectual curiosity. These are the types of motivations. So this is one very important uh, difference between these two types of uh, learning or settings, traditional versus critical. But this is not just something theoretical, why you even bother approaching the text. Obviously, it also has a very clear uh, influence or effect. it does affect how you approach these texts. It starts by, we can start by talking about the choice of which texts do we study in, diff in each one of these settings. The fields of study, for traditional, in traditional learning, what do people usually study and why? What would traditional groups, and again, try to think about more traditional circles for that matter, what types of, of texts are they draw, being, uh, they're usually drawn to and why? What do they study in yeshiva? Gemara. So they study Gemara. They study Bible, Tanakh maybe. They study Gemara. What else did they study? Nach. Nach, what else? If they're mainly interested in fulfilling mitzvah Talmud Torah, so they're probably going to take texts that are more, that have a higher, higher status from a religious perspective, but also texts that could actually help them meet their goals on a practical level. They're going to study Gemara and they're going to focus on Halakha. They're going to choose those texts that affect their uh, daily lives or daily experience. Here, so you see Bible, rabbinic literature, Jewish law. These would be the main themes that people would study. What about in academic settings? Critical scholarship. What do they choose to study? What are they drawn to? Yes, comment, speak. Feel free. Contemporary texts in the Middle East or, uh, or contemporary to any of the sources that you've, things that engage traditional learners. Right, so I think they would probably study anything that connects to Judaism if we're talking about Jewish studies. Sometimes I, I would say that scholars even are drawn in the university for sure, to the most obscure 
irrelevant texts in the world because that's more fascinating. And why bother studying the same text that everybody was, you know, uh, dealing with for so many centuries? Why not bother? Why not approach other texts? Learn about other communities? Why learn about alternative uh, sources that were not common, that were not known or is, have not been studied uh, beforehand? So the, the motivation clearly affects also what people study. And in addition to that, I would say that the fields of study are much more broad. People would study grammar, or history, poetry, philosophy. I'm not claiming that in the medieval period, people didn't study other fields, but certainly the main stream were focused on Bible, rabbinic literature, or maybe Jewish law, and other fields were only more, much more marginal. Modern st scholars are interested in everything that could meet their uh, curiosity, they could fulfill their need to, uh, to learn more about Judaism, and even if it's things that are more obscure and not necessarily mainstream. So, so far we spoke about motivation and about the fields of study, but I think that there's one more element that is not less important and involves not just what we study and why we study it, but also how do we approach these texts? And perhaps this is the most important and I guess the deeper uh, psychological difference between the two types of uh, thinking, the conceptual differences. So let's start with, uh, again, with a traditional way of learning texts. And I wanna compare it immediately with the way that scholars approach those same texts. And I, re I wanna refer to a few concepts uh, that I think clearly distinguish between traditional ways of viewing texts and critical ways of viewing those same texts. The first thing involves the concept of time, the time element. Uh, what is, how do traditional people, what do traditional people think about time when they study these, their sources and what do critical scholars think about time? Uh, you already see it here on the slide, but I think that the approaches are very, very different. I would say that traditional scholars are threatened by the concept of time. Traditional people prefer to view their tradition as something that remains static, that does not really change in the course of history, that remains exactly the same. Why is that? Again, think about the extreme traditional people, just so you make this distinction more clear. Why do you suppose, if I'm right, why do you suppose traditional people might be more threatened by the time aspect, by the time component when they study? Why is that a, yes? Are they actually, I, I just, thought I looked at it a little differently um, because halacha changes and and each one is built on the other. I mean, time is broken down in the Gemara when it, they're discussing over a period of what, 400, 500 years. But I, I'm not quite sure what you mean because it doesn't seem that static. It keeps changing. Okay, so I'm not trying, uh, my goal now is not to ask, does halacha change or not change? Obviously, people have many different opinions about this matter and we can argue that halakha drastically changes or Judaism in general drastically changes in the, cor in the course of history, but at least from the way that traditional people perceive themselves. Uh, oh. I, I, I have to add something. In addition to being at Hebrew University and at Harvard University for a few years, I'd studied, I, I think you mentioned it, you might've mentioned it before I was half listening. Uh, I studied at the Mir Yeshiva for a few years yeah. also. And uh, I could tell you that the Mir Yeshiva people don't like to think about, they won't talk about their tradition as something that evolves and changes. They, they prefer to think maybe we're exposing, we're trying to apply the Tanakh or biblical law to modern times. They're not gonna claim that the microwave existed at the time of Moshe Rabbeinu, but it's more about applying the law and not so much about thinking, look, our tradition is actually an evolving tradition that changes, that grows, that, the, the, the tendency often, and certainly before the 19th century, the tendency was certainly to view halakha as something, or to view Judaism, or to, to view Jewish law as something that is more static. We want to think that we're just exposing things that perhaps were rooted in, the, in earlier texts and we're revealing them, we're applying them, but we're not changing them. So, so the, the times change, but the tradition doesn't change. It's just... Exa right. I'm not saying the reality... Perfect. What you're saying is perfect. I'm not saying that the world doesn't change. And obviously, we have new challenges and new questions. But traditional people, radical traditional people, would prefer to think 
that their tradition is really static. Nothing, the Torah does not change. Jewish law does not change. It, it, what it needs to do is try to apply ancient laws in modern reality, but not to change it. It's not a dynamic tradition. And why, is, why are traditional people so threatened by the idea of time? When we talk about changes, what are we implying? Let's add one more thing before I say that. When we, say, when we talk about changes, what, could, what type of changes can happen to a tradition? If it's not static, so then what could happen to it? I think there are two alternative scenarios that we can think of. If a tradition changes, what could lead for, for such changes? Two scenarios, what do you think? One scenario will be what? What leads to changes? Why would a tradition change? People stop learning. A slippery slope kind of response that if you change anything in the end, you lose it all. So, but why do things change? If we think about changes, so I think we can talk about, we can think about two kind of uh, two scenarios. One scenario is it because things get uh, forgotten, deterioration of a tradition. Some ideas were forgotten, lost along the way. People did not transmit the tradition accurately and things have been uh, distorted in the course of time. That's one scenario. And the other scenario is not because people forget or uh, not because people make mistakes, but rather because we're talking about intentional changes because people want to change what the existing tradition. I think from a traditional perspective, both of them are terrible options. I don't know, it's up for you to decide what's worse, to assume that our tradition got distorted or to assume that our tradition keeps changing, that people manipulate their tradition and do whatever they want to do with that with their past. But both scenarios from a traditional perspective are obviously perceived as threats. Turning to, so the first thing I wanted to refer to is the static versus dynamic. Critical people, on the other hand, I, I would say that's it's almost at the heart of modern scholarship. When you talk about text, you want to talk about their history. You want to talk about how they change, how they uh, evolve in the course of time, what got lost, what got changed, how did people play around with certain ideas, what forms and shapes did they get in the course of history. I think that at the root of the traditional fear of uh, thinking about a tradition as something dynamic, which, uh, the root for this is what you were saying before, I forget who it was, Elizabeth or I'm not sure if it was you, you were saying that one of the traditional main uh, foundations is to think that everything comes from God, that it's divine. If, it, if we assume that things change, evolve, so in a sense we're admitting that there's a human component in our tradition, and that's not something we really like so much. We prefer to think that Moshe Rabbeinu got the Torah, and boom, that's what we have today. How do you say tradition in Hebrew? Masorah. Masoret or Masora. What's the root of this word, Masora? Um, what I'm saying now is actually not 100% uh, accepted on everybody, but let's at least say one option. What is mesora? Mesora. Mesora, what's the root of that? What's the verb that stands in that word? What is masora? What's the root of that word? It's not a test. It's not a test. I'm trying to be, <laughs> trying to give you time to think. That's all. So masora probably is rooted in the word, in the verb masar. Masar is to hand over, to pass, pass around. So traditional people want to think that all they're doing is they're just passing on a tradition. They're not changing it. They're, you know, they, they put their gloves on before they touch this tradition. It's 100%. Uh, they don't touch, they don't change anything. Thinking about a tradition as something that changes is probably the first uh, a major threat from a, from a traditional perspective. And I would say that this is one important difference between traditional and critical uh, approaches to Judaism. The second thing I wrote here uh, is the, involves the context. If before we were talking about the time, so now we're all moving to talk about the context. And here too, I think that there's a very big difference between uh, traditional and critical ways of viewing our tradition. For traditional people, again, think about the extreme end of that group. Uh, I think that traditional people want to think about our tradition as a sterile tradition. Our tradition, although it is part of history, but it doesn't really, there's no really dialogue or uh, 
connections between Judaism and the outer world. We prefer to think that our religion or our tradition is kind of uh, sterile. It's not influenced, it's not inspired by, outsor, by, outer, uh, by the historical context, by the environment, by the surroundings. Whereas critical scholars, I think, will assume and will try to show that there's actually a clear, uh, a lot of connections or hidden dialogue or, in, or uh, influences between Judaism and the outer world. I'm not here, I'm emphasizing mainly the fact that Judaism was also influenced or inspired by external ideas. It's not 100% original. It's not, not, Jews don't have copyrights for every idea that is part of their tradition. They're actually influenced by other uh, sources or cultures or religions as well. And here I think it's pretty obvious, but I'll still ask you, why do you suppose traditional people want to describe their tradition as something sterile and not something that is uh, being inspired or in dialogue with the environment? It's obvious, but still tell me why. Because then it's not divine. It's not. Because again, it's not divine. If we're right, if we're talking about influence, it's perfect. If, if we're inspired by other cultures, if we got certain ideas from uh, our, uh, you know, uh, other cultures or all other religions that were out there, so then it's not really divine. It's, it's actually a human uh, invention if we, if we start claiming that uh, the idea of olam haba or tchiyat hamitim are actually rooted in uh, Greek or Hellenistic ideas or who knows what, so we're, we're bringing, we're trying, we're challenging the divine origin of our tradition. So the, se the second theme or the second conceptual difference between traditional and critical scholars, I think, involves not the time, but rather the context. Number three. And again, I'm talking about tendencies. I'm not saying that you won't find exceptions or that it's 100% black and white, but I think the tendencies and the, the third element I wanna to refer to is how much are we open to thinking about our tradition in pluralistic manners? Thinking about the var variety of, uh, of, of uh, Judaisms. I think that for traditional people, there's like a, a strong need to try to harmonize between different sources, between different texts. You were referring to before to the stories of creation, and that's a great example. We read the two stories of creation, and in a traditional uh, society or a, a set of a mindset, we immediately try to harmonize, to solve the contradictions. So this is within the Bible, but also when we deal with other sources. We read the uh, two uh, contradictory Mishnayot, we want to solve them. We read two different sugiyot that don't work together. Let's read how, how to harmonize them. We have this very strong need to solve problems and to show that everything actually goes in harmony. And I don't, uh, I'm not a fool, and I know that there are machlokot, there are controversies in the Gemara, obviously, but still, there's something very much, we still have a very strong need to minimize that. We view controversies as something problematic. We want to think that there is no, uh, great diversity, but rather we at least aim to harmonize texts. Whereas uh, critical scholars are very different in their approach. They're actually trying to emphasize the variety of uh, texts. They want to show that there's no one Judaism. There are actually very many forms and shapes of Judaism. And I'm not talking only about traditional texts such as Bavli and Yerushalmi or Mishnah and Tosefta. We'll talk about all these later on in the course, but also just think, scholars are interested in the Dead Sea Scrolls, they're interested in Samaritans and Sadducees. they're interested in the Karaites, they're interested in various forms and shapes of Judaism, whereas traditional people usually will try to harmonize and what doesn't work out will just remain outside. And here too, I wanna to ask you, where is that rooted? Why do traditional people have this need to harmonize? Why are they threatened to a certain extent uh, by having all these uh, pluralistic opinions or pluralistic approaches or controversies in general. Why is that a threat from a traditional perspective? Yes? The same reason, which is that if it's all supposed to come from one source, which is God, then it should all match up to each other. Right. If, if, if this is a divine t tradition, if it comes from God, how can we have two different versions of that tradition? As soon as we accept the fact that we have two options, 
in a sense, we're admitting that at least 50% is wrong and 50% is human. And if there are debates and arguments and uh, uh, approaches to a certain elements in Judaism, it accepts the fact, we're accepting the fact that there's something human about our tradition. So we're talking about, so far we spoke about three conceptual differences. It's not just about why we approach Jewish text or which text do we approach, but also how do we treat those texts? Do we let the time component play a role in our studies? Do we allow, uh, do we try to contextualize the text or we prefer to think about it as something that is irrelevant, that uh, Moshe Rabbeinu and Rabbi Akiva and everybody are working in the same exact environment and they're, they could have been, Rabbi Akiva could have been a great student at the Mir Yeshiva and Moshe Rabbeinu would find the great, have a, a great time studying in uh, Drisha and everything would work perfect. Not Drisha is not a good example for this. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, I think that this is, a, again, the, the context. The third element we're talking about so far is the variety versus the need to harmonize. And the last thing is, and the last item is something that you were also referring to, and that's also the way we approach those texts. Do we uh, approach these texts in a faith, trust, we believe everything the texts tell us and we want to assume it's all true? Or alternatively, we are more skeptical we're, we believe that we're going to be objective and try to judge things, whether they are rational or not, and not just assume that whatever the text says is true. And here too, I think it's rooted maybe indirectly by the fact that we think if it's divine, we can speculate, we can raise questions about everything. Certain things are just beyond our questioning. We just have to assume that this is it. Okay, but I want to say... Yes. Comments. I'm happy to hear comments. Okay, isn't there a text somewhere that says that, uh, that maybe it's a, a midrash, that um, if Moshe Rabbeinu sat in Rabbi Akiva's class, he would have no clue what was going on? You're right. You're Thanks. absolutely right. <laughs> Look, what I'm, tr what I'm saying now, everything I said so far, obviously is slightly sl simplified. And I'm not, I, I'm not saying that the rabbis don't accept the fact that there are some changes and you won't find some sources that talk about controversies and you won't find some sources that do refer to contextual, that do show that there is some context to things that are emerged, obviously. But I think that when you're talking, this is what I was saying so far is more uh, from, a psycholo from a psychological perspective, I would say. Right. If you if you go to your therapy and you will try to analyze how traditional people think versus how do critical people view those this text, you feel that there's something very strong. So again, I'm, it's it's always it, there's always a, when I, what I'm saying now is obviously a little bit simplifying the picture, but I, I still feel that there's something very true about this. And I want to say one more thing. This is not all my ideas. I'm not coming up with my original description of traditional versus critical scholarship. There are numerous essays that were devoted to this. I'm just going to refer you to one text that I recommend. You can see both in Hebrew and in English. Did you hear? He's in New York. You know who is Ismar Shosh? Have you heard of him? No. Ismar he was Shosh. the chancellor. He was the chancellor of the Jewish Theological Seminary. Excellent. So he was the chancellor of the of JTS and he, he lives down in Manhattan somewhere. Uh, and he wrote a very important book called From Text to Context that was also translated to Hebrew. It's called Hapniya Le'avar Ba'yahadut HaModernit. It's a collection of articles. I read this when I was in high school or maybe when I was at Yeshiva, way before I was in, involved in what I'm doing now. And I was just fascinated by these texts. And ever since, I read his articles so many times. It's beautiful pieces, uh, really nice stuff. And he and he has a few articles where he talks about the differences. And it's, again, he's not saying it from uh, his own ideological perspective. He's trying to de describe this. So I, I really recommend if you want to read it. Mm -hmm. Since then, I even became a close friend of his. I visited him, in, visited him in his house. He's a very nice guy. And uh, if you ever get a chance to speak to him, you can really learn a lot from, the, from his way of viewing Jewish scholarship. He mainly focuses in books about the way we approach Jewish history, but a lot of the ideas that he's saying are relevant for Jewish studies in, in general as well. So what we've done so far, I'm summarizing the first part of today's lecture. We were trying to say, we said that we give a special name, Wissenschaft, this fancy name, Wissenschaft, this Judentum for modern Jewish studies. And I said, why do we give it such a fancy name for this phenomenon? And the first reason is, because we're talking about something that is different 
in the way that people approach Jewish texts in modern times. And that is a critical way of looking at those texts. There are many things that we can say about critical versus traditional, and I was trying to focus on some of them. But it's not only about traditional versus uh, critical ways of viewing texts, it's also about the historical and ideological setting in which modern Jewish studies emerge. And this is what I wanna uh, devote our last, let me see how much time, you're gonna tell me how much time we have left, right? <laughs> Give me a, tell. how do you say in football, you have two minute warning or something, right? So you have to okay. tell me two minutes <laughs> before the end. You got about I know. 20 minutes, so you still got like a third of the class. Yeah, yeah, good, good, good. <laughs> okay, so now we're moving to the other part of our dis uh, uh, discussion, and that's the historical and ideological context in which modern Jewish studies emerge. And I think this is also something very crucial for understanding this phenomenon. So first we'll talk about history in general, and we'll kind of move uh, closer and closer to uh, our question. So let's start with the historical context and we'll talk briefly about the turn from the 18th century to the 19th century. I'm starting to talk, I'm going to start with world history or German history. So which uh, movements or what kind of atmosphere is uh, very dominant in the 18th century? Which movements? Anybody knows? Enlightenment. Right, so the 18th century is mostly associated with the Enlightenment, which is also associated with rationalism or rational type of thinking, universalism, humanism, all of these are terms that are cl closely connected. And we're not gonna, it's not a course about the world history and or European history, but I think you already have a sense of each one of these uh, ideas. And the next thing I wanna ask you, how does that affect Jews? How do, let's start by saying, asking, how does that make Christians think about Jews, how does that change the way that Jews are perceived in the 18th century? Good or bad, positive or negative? Is this atmosphere good for the Jews or bad for the Jews? It was good. bad, I think. What do you say? I I, it was, it depended. It opened up things for Jews, but also. Right. Yeah. For, so overall, for sure, it's a positive development. Uh, Non-Jews, enlightened Christians are much more tolerant toward Jews, and the emancipation is becoming an option. Jews are starting to dream that maybe one day they will be uh, emancipated, they will have equal rights, in, uh, at least in, uh, in some uh, European countries. So this is the 18th centuries, and how do Jews react to all of this? So obviously Jews are very optimistic about this, and many of them are culturally becoming assimilated. In the 18th centuries, Jews are still uh, following, at least 99% of Jews are still following Jewish law. They're still, uh, I don't like anachronistically calling them datiim, religious Jews, but they're fulfilling halakha, at least most of them, 90% of them, 99% of them were following uh, Jewish law. So that's the, that, this is the situation in the, in the 18th century. Who's this guy here in the picture? Uh, Moses Mendelssohn. Right, Moses Mendelssohn, and you see what it says here? This is a signature of Moses Mendelssohn. It says, Ha Katan, I think, Moshe mi desoy. Ha Katan, meaning the, he's not calling himself a rabbi or just a, the simple Jew. Moshe, Moshe Mendelssohn, Moses Mendelssohn. These are another few, uh, this is another famous picture. Everybody familiar with this painting? It's a very famous painting. So here you see again Moses Mendelssohn. This is a uh, Gotthold Ephraim Lessing, who was a very important Christian, enlightened, uh, enlightened Christian. And this is a guy named Lafater. So here you see a very interesting encounter of Jews and Christians for the first time. They're playing chess and having a discussion about something. These are two other Jewish uh, enlightened Jews of the time. One of them is Solomon Maimon. And the other one is Naftali Herz Vesely. Have you heard these names? You don't have to say if you didn't, but for now on, you heard those names. These are important figures in uh, modern Jewish history. So this is uh, the 18th century. However, when we move to the 19th cent century, things change drastically. So if we said that in the, okay, we're moving on. If we said that the 18th century is associated with uh, enlightenment movements, so what's the 18th century associated with? Which movement is very dominant then? What's the 19th century? The right, excellent. 
You see, I prepared this before class. So you got, the, you got it right. Romanticism, nationalism. So the, 18th, the 19th century is, in a sense, uh, refraining from the Enlightenment or going back and moving to medieval European kind of thinking, le much less universal, humanistic, and much more uh, thinking about different nations in, within Europe. How does that meet Jews? Good for the Jews or bad for the Jews? Ignore the picture for a second because that gives away the answer. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> bad for the Jews because they right. were be allied with the king or whoever. Right, so the Jews are obviously suffering because of this, and it's not just something uh, theoretical. Here you see a picture from what is called the Hep Hep riots. It's very famous riots in 1819 in uh, Frankfurt. But in general, anti-Semitism will start emerging. Maybe the official word of anti-Semitism will only appear in the 1870s, but the uh, anti-Semitism as a phenomenon already uh, is dominant, is, is uh, out there already from the beginning of the 18th century. And obviously, Jews are left very much confused with this, uh, in this situation. Many Jews feel, haven't we done a lot to try to assimilate, to become part of the German society, to become part of German uh, life? Nevertheless, nothing works out. We're still left out. We're still not becoming part of uh, the German nation. In other countries, the story was slightly better. I should emphasize in France, Jews did get equal rights fairly early also in the Netherlands, but at least in Germany, when will Jews get equal rights in Germany? Anybody? When did Jews become equal citizens in Germany? Well, it took much, much longer. It was only in the 1870s, really much, much later. So Jews are really confused. And uh, at that point, I think it makes, we can understand why, different religious movements emerge, the different uh, movements that are also influencing us nowadays. So here we're moving to the ideological uh, component, formation of four dominant religious camps. Before we go through all these four camps, I wanna say uh, a few things, comment a few, uh, add a few things. The differences between these religious groups or camps or movements involve various factors not and not, uh, they're not only distinguished by the degree of commitment to minhag halacha. Sometimes people say, especially uh, you hear this, uh, you, you feel this kind of description in Israel when people refer to, think that uh, reform, conservatives are all just degrees of how much you're committed to halacha. But the differences were actually not just about the commitment to halacha, but it also involved other factors as well. And Another thing I want to emphasize, the formation of these four camps that we're going to talk about was a gradual process, meaning the leaders or the founders of each one of these movements were actually close friends for many, many years. They were not uh, opponents, they were close friends. And only, it's only after a long process that these people become uh, rivals and start uh, coming up with uh, alternative camps or religious groups or uh, trends. Finally, I added here, that when we describe these groups, we need to be aware, be aware, chronological, and I should have added here in geographical gaps. Uh, people often, when they describe the four movements, the four dominant movements in Judaism in the 19th century, so they're thinking about it uh, in light of later developments. But we do need to take into account that the developments of these four important religious camps are not, uh, they develop gradually and what we think today as reform or conservative or orthodox or neo-orthodox is not necessarily what they had in mind. Also from a geographical perspective, Jews in Eastern Europe and, or in Western Europe, even if they have the same official title, they're both called orthodox or reform, they might have very different ideas about uh, certain elements in their Jewish ideology. So taking all of this into account, now we'll try to briefly because we only were getting short in time. Briefly, we're gonna to try to sketch who are those four camps, who are the leaders of each one of these camps, and then we'll try to tie up everything. We have 10 minutes and it would work perfectly. Don't worry, I'm not uh, forgetting the time, I know. Okay, so we'll start with uh, which four groups am I here? So the first, uh, I'm not gonna do it from um, by a specific order. I started with what people refer to as the reform movement. 
the person who's mostly associated with the reform movement, which is, I would say, the most liberal group of these was Samuel Holdheim, Shmuel Holdheim, who was a rabbi in Frankfurt, the Oder, 1806 to 1860. And what he was preaching for was the most, he was most radical in his approach to halakha. He was saying that radical changes are required to allow Jews and Christians to become socially integrated. He was preaching for, you know, changing Shabbat to Sunday. For sure, we don't need to circumcise. And more radical, I'm adding at the end, his approach to the Bible that it's completely human and also rabbinic literature, completely human. He didn't perceive these texts as divine in the way that we've, we view divine texts in orthodox circles. So that's the reform movement, the most, ra most liberal version. On the other extreme, in Germany, who am I going to have in the next slide? The other extreme, orthodoxy in Germany. Samuel Raphael Hirsch. Right, excellent. It's neo-orthodoxy. It's not ultra-orthodoxy. In uh, Hungary, there was a different orthodox rabbi, Rabbi Moses Sofer, the Khatam Sofer. He and Rav Samuel, uh, Samson Raphael Hirsch were close friends, and they probably thought that they belonged to the same camp. But again, we have to be aware of these geographical differences. He's neo-orthodox. He's not or ultra-orthodox. He's much more open-minded. So this is Samson Raphael Hirsch. I have to confess I'm a descendant of his. Many generations separate us, but somehow. Uh, so he's 1808 to 1888, full commitment to halacha. However, he has an other idea such as the person needs to be Yisrael Mensch. What does that mean? What is Yisrael Mensch? How do you combine Yisrael and Mensch? What is a Mensch? It's 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 close to that, but it's not. A, I think the focus is not on that. What is a mensch? A good person. Right. You have to be a Jew, but also a human being. Right. You can't just. You don't just care about uh, your worms and your lettuce, but you have to be also a nice guy, a, an educated nice guy. You have to uh, act in a way that would make people uh, like you. Torah derech eretz. Sometimes people refer to. You have to learn Torah, but you also have to be a human being. He was willing to adopt cultural elements that do not negate halacha directly, meaning he was fine having a choir in his synagogue and not allow kids to come in and make noise. That's fine with him. But he wouldn't like the fact that as soon as it uh, touches uh, and involves violating halachot, so then the, that's already the, his, uh, his, that's where he draws the line. He believed the Bible is 100% divine, whereas rabbinic literature and the rabbinic literature as well, all divine. Abraham Geiger and Zacharia Frenkel are the ones that are in between. And again, it, we tend to think these are opponents, but they were actually close friends. Abraham Geiger and Rav, Rav, Rabbi Samson Raphael Hirsch studied together. They were a chavruta. They were a learning <laughs> match. You studied the tractate Zvachim when they were in their 20s in the university. They were close friends before they got, uh, before, before they became these uh, founders of different religious groups. Abraham Geiger is 1810 to 1874. People often describe him as the founder of Reform Judaism, but at least if you ask Reform, uh, people who are a part of the liberal or Reform movement, so they would distinguish between these two figures. Uh, Abraham Geiger was much more moderate in his approach to halacha. He does believe that halacha needs to change, but mainly based on rational criteria. In the, the synagogue is the main target that needs to change. But I would emphasize, I would say, the main, the main thing that separates him between, separates Geiger and Holtheim, Geiger does believe that halacha and Judaism should remain, and the need to change it is only because he felt that if, we, if Judaism will freeze and not manage to uh, adapt itself to, the, to modernity, people will just leave it and just uh, abandon Judaism altogether. So the changes were, in a sense, a way of defending Judaism and, or, or helping it survive in the modern world. He did not perceive this as an, a way to assimilate Jews. Finally, the fourth group, the fourth, fourth camp is Scharia Frankel, the positive historical school, what people refer to as the conservative Judaism today. He was also more moderate about the, his approach to halacha. He believed that things can change, but it should be done in almost an unnoticeable way. You shouldn't feel how changes are taking place, but we should allow things to change. He, there's a very strong romantic emphasis in his approach. For example, he was very much against changing the language of prayer to, from, uh, German, to, from Hebrew to German, although it's not really founded 
hundred percent in the halacha, but he felt this is something that is so important for Jewish life and we can't change that. So we're talking about four religious groups, which are in a sense, different attempts to uh, solve or respond to this confusion. What do we do with Judaism in the 19th century? Nobody wants us. What should we do? Should we further assimilate ourselves or perhaps we should rethink about Judaism so it still remains relevant and attractive? And to what extent are we supposed to adopt our uh, religion to modern times? Why all of this is relevant? Sorry, can I? Yes. Did we say what Geiger's attitude to um, the approach to Bible and rabbinic li literature were? I think um, I mentioned this. No, if I didn't put it so. Abraham Geiger believed that the Bible is divine, but his way of defining divine was different than what rabbis would define as divine. So he would probably think more about inspiration or whereas rabbinic literature clearly viewed as something that is a human development. We'll talk about this a lot later on. I'm just trying to give a very general uh, description. Why is all of this relevant for us? So I'll give you a very simple answer. Because Abraham Geiger and Zacharia Frankel and Samuel Holdheim, at least these three, were perhaps the most dominant Wissenschaft des Judentums scholars. They were the most important scholars in the same time frame, in the same period. So the rabbis, the founders of all these different root, uh, groups, ideological groups in 19th century Judaism are also the scholars. And this brings us to the final question that I wanted to ask you. And this is where we're going to end. How, do we, how did these religious camps approach critical scholarship of Judaism? And how could objective critical scholarship coexist with clear ideological agendas? I said that what makes Wissenschaft des Juden to modern Jewish studies unique is A, it's critical, but also it's ideological. And let's make sense of that. We approach, we think that critical scholarship means being objective. These people are clearly not objective. Each one has his own take how religion should change, how Judaism should change. But how did they explain themselves? How can you become a rabbi involved in 19th century uh, discussion of, Judy, of which direction should Judaism go and at the same time be Jewish scholars? Don't these two contradict? Can you become a scholar and also a rabbi? We think that scholars are supposed to be objective. I'm not saying they are. But at least we want to think that they are. These people are very much involved in religious debates. They're fighting all day long about, uh, should we cancel this minhag or that minhag? Should we keep this halacha or that halacha? And at the same time, these are scholars. They're supposed to be out of this whole argument. So this is going to be my last uh, sentence for today, and I will try to emphasize that I think it was exactly the opposite. Because if you think about it, we said that critical thinking about Judaism involves accepting the time component, com, uh, component the context, the variety of Judaisms. And I think all these essential ideas were also very crucial for them from a religious perspective, from an ideological perspective. If Abraham Geiger wants to preach for changes in Judaism, he has to show that in the past, Judaism was also a dynamic religion. What allows you to change things? If, you can't, if everything was static so far, why change it? So for people who are involved in this, these battles, it's very important to show that there's a lot of dynamics going on throughout history. We're actually continuing a process that always existed. Same is true about the context. We want to make Judaism adopt itself to 19th century German environment. We need to show that Judaism was always open to the outside world, to the external circumstances. It was never a sterile religion. If we want to allow different groups or different types of uh, uh, ways to follow Judaism, we have to show that Judaism was always pluralistic, that there was always room for different groups and camps. It's not something that we should fight against. So in this interesting way, it was scholars who were also very much invested in uh, these ideological battles. Critical scholars and Jewish rabbis were very often the same people. Next week, we'll continue with our introduction. We have one more part for this introduction, and then we're actually going to study these texts. So it's not going to be theoretical like now. I told you it's going to be theoretical today and next week. Afterwards, we're going to study actual texts, I promise you.
Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. It's very interesting. Very Thank you. Very good. Interesting. Very good. Could ask, Thank what you. Was the desire for integration with Christians motivated by the desire for emancipation? Again, I'm, I'm, I missed you. One more time. No, it's in the chat. Judith asked, was the desire for integration with Christians motivated by the desire for emancipation? It's a very big question what you're asking. In, in a, Orthodox people often wanted to present it that way, that it's all a matter of getting equal rights and getting emancipation. But I think it was probably much more complicated. This uh, Jews wanted to become, to get equal rights and they were striving for emancipation because they believed that they wanted, they wanted to become part of the German culture. So it's, you can't just talk about it from a, you know, on a practical level. It's not just getting equal rights so they can do business with non-Jews. They were also very much inspired and they were part of this culture. So I think that it's, it's probably much more, uh, the connections between the, the two cultures and the strive for emancipations are very much closely related. Okay, I hope I'm giving you some sort of answer. That's a good answer. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So thank, thank you, you, Dr. Gaffney, for a great start thank to the class. We're looking forward to next week. Thank you to everyone who joined us today on Zoom, on Drisha Live, and on Facebook. We are going to continue our fall programming tonight at 8 p.m. with the first part of a multi-part series by Rabbi David Silber on imagining King David in the Babylonian Talmud, and tomorrow night at 8 p.m. by Miriam Gudweiser on husbands, wives, and human dignity in the Talmud. In addition to these, we have many more classes happening right now. Um, you can find out more information and find the registration links on our website at www.drisha.org classes. And you can always watch live at www.drisha.org live. Thank you again, Dr. Gaffney, for this opportunity to learn with you and for everyone who attended. And we look forward to seeing you at one of our upcoming classes. Thank you.